What's going on, everybody? Happy Sunday evening. Hope you had a wonderful week. Welcome into Team Staniel Live. My name is Eric Staniel, where we are talking all things Cincinnati news, real estate, and just living in the city. So welcome in. Uh, as always, if you are hopping in the chat, let us know where you're watching from. Love the fact that we get to reach people all over the country and the world, even different countries tuning in. If you're thinking about moving to the Cincinnati area, I'm hoping that this channel is a resource for you. Tonight, we are talking about the Cincinnati economy. We're talking about jobs. We're talking about the unemployment rate. We're talking about home prices and real estate prices. And are they going up and are they going down? I've got tons of data to share with you. Uh, I geek out on this stuff. Um, I don't know. I like charts and I like graphs and I always liked math growing up. Uh, part of that makes me a really good real estate agent. And I like negotiating and I like helping my clients um, win in negotiating and, um, and, and make sound wise financial investments. So we're going to look at what's going on in Cincinnati, how it's comparing to other Midwest cities. It is a, is it a good bet for you, uh, to live here, to move here, to put your dollars into real estate? Um, is it, a, is it a place where there's a lot of jobs? So we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, I hope you guys are having a great Sunday. Uh, I got a lot of things done today. Um, Chores around the house. Sunday for us at our house, we've got five kids. My oldest is 13, so 13, 11, 8, 6, and 4. We've had a stomach bug this last week, and it's kind of like knocked off one person like every other day. And so um, I'll try. Uh, I think my wife's starting to get it tonight, so I might need to bounce fairly early to help her out at home. But I want to get through this content. Um, but Sunday is our day, kind of our chore day when we don't have a church service where we're knocking out a lot of things. And it was awesome today. It was like 65 degrees, sunny. So we were kind of cleaning up the yard. We had a grill down in our basement that I hadn't put together yet. One of those uh, awesome Blackstone grills we got for Christmas. And so I put that together. Um, so hoping to make tons of pancakes and bacon and like smash burgers on that thing soon. Um, all, yeah, we got some things done. I got a, a other, other stuff cleaning out the basement, but hopefully you guys are starting to do some of that spring cleaning as well or just enjoy the day, had a great day. So um, yeah, but let, let me know in the chat what's up. I, as always, of course, if you have questions or any comments as we go, uh, feel free to jump them in the chat, put them in the chat, and I will answer those questions. Let's dive into it. Number one on the list tonight. First article I want to look at is what's going on in the Cincinnati economy. So this headline is the economy regains jobs lost during the pandemic, and it's set to add jobs in 2024. This is a banking, this is an economic advisor from PNC Bank that's actually based in Pittsburgh. Uh, but let me just jump into this article and we'll go through it. Greater Cincinnati's economy is poised to grow again this year now that, now that it has recouped all the jobs it lost during the COVID-19 pandemic and more. Uh, that's one of the key points Stuart Hoffman, senior economic advisor at Pittsburgh-based PNC, discussed last week when he came to town and talked to clients. At the Queen City Club, the labor force has done fairly well. He said, you've been able to attract people and retain people here. And I want to talk about that for just a second. Attracting people to a Midwest city can always be challenging when you are, you know, facing, you're competing against other cities. You're competing against San Diego and LA and New York and Chicago and Seattle and Florida. Uh, so how do you attract people here? That, that can be a challenge. Um, one thing I find here, I have this conversation over and over had this conversation with someone who's actually living in Nashville right now, uh, but looking to move up uh, up here and buy a house, buy a new construction house, because he's just getting priced out of Nashville. And I know Nashville well. I went to college in Nashville for four years or in the early 2000s. and uh, But Nashville right now is blown up. And so he was kind of like looking at the pricing of houses and like, look, anything that's like a... <laughs> The starter homes are all like three to four hundred thousand dollars, and the quality is like pretty terrible. Otherwise, you're buying something like eight hundred thousand dollars plus, uh, up over a million. He's like, I, I just can't really afford that. I'm looking at Cincinnati, it's four hours north. He's kind of looking around where family is. He's got some family in Tennessee, some family in Virginia, some family in Toledo. He's like, Cincinnati makes sense, <clears throat> excuse me. And then when he came here, he's been here a few times. He's a St. Louis Cardinals fan, I'm not going to hold that against him for now. Um, but he's like, I've been in Cincinnati, uh, been a great American ballpark. And every time I go there, I like it. It's pretty cool. And that's a common story I feel like I get a lot is Cincinnati tends to be overlooked nationally. In fact, I think we'll see that in the numbers here in just a minute and, and something else in this article that I want to point out. But when people get here and they see the beauty of the city, the art of the city, um, you know, the culture, the restaurants, the professional sports, the different amenities that the city has to offer, they're like, 
hey, this city's pretty cool. <laughs> and they're generally usually pretty surprised when they get here. Now, some of the things against us, and I've done this in a recent video of like, why do people not like it here? The weather, you know, we get, we, we do get all four seasons, which I actually like, but winter kind of sucks. You know, um, we just sell, we had a family team meeting this morning and we were, um, I started the meeting by saying, Hey guys, February's over. And we're like, yeah, cause I hate February. <laughs> like it's cold, it's dark. And, uh, you know, you're just kind of tired with winter by the time that it's here. But now, uh, today was 65 and I'm starting to see buds on trees and some of our crocuses in our ground are starting to come up. It's like, yes, spring is coming. So that's a really exciting part. Um, all right, back to this article and we'll, we'll keep dig diving in here, but I just think that's important that you can attract people, but you also have to retain people to the city. He says that speaks to the diversified economy with manufacturing and non-manufacturing. Cincinnati has done better than a lot of other Midwest cities in retaining and attracting a workforce. So I just want to say that again. Cincinnati has done better than a lot of other Midwest cities in retaining and attracting a workforce. So post COVID-19, Cincinnati is beating out cities like Pittsburgh and Indy and Columbus and uh, I don't know, Cleveland and um, other Midwest cities, maybe St. Louis at both retaining and attracting a workforce. That's why Cincinnati, he says, has done better than Dayton, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Chicago. Cincinnati has regained all of the jobs it's lost during the pandemic and then some. It has 1.17 million jobs. That's 41,000 jobs above its pre-pandemic peak. So we've fully recovered from where we were at jobs-wise before the pandemic and have exceeded it by 41,000 jobs. That brings Cincinnati on par with the national rebound. So pretty average nationally in terms of more jobs than before the pandemic. But again, he's saying we're beating out other Midwest cities in terms of attracting and retaining, such as Dayton, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Chicago. And I mean, come on, who wants to go to Cleveland or Pittsburgh anyway? So um, for that matter, Detroit. And I'm from Michigan originally. Cincinnati added about 20,000 jobs last year, giving it just under 2% growth. That's even with the nation's growth. And Hoffman pointed out the logic, the local region performed much better than similar markets, Pittsburgh and Cleveland. The local job market also looks good from an unemployment standpoint. Greater Cincinnati's most recent jobless rate of 3.5% in December of 2023 came in better than the nation's 3.7% rate. And he expects the unemployment rate to hover in the 35 to 4% range this year too. So about average to what the national is, if not slightly better in terms of unemployment. So a lot of people reach out to me and they say, hey, are there jobs there? I'm like, yeah, we're doing all right. There are plenty of jobs here and it's a it's a diverse economy, which is nice. We have a, we're not based on just one specific type of industry. That's around the national rate, which is as strong for the past two years as it's been in the 1960s. The economy is in the best shape it's been in almost 60 years, he said. So we're poised to do well. Cincinnati's really poised. While Hoffman sees job growth slowing this year, he still expects greater Cincinnati to add about 10,000 jobs in 2024. That brings job growth to around 1%, about the same in the national prediction. Cincinnati is pretty much following the national lead. Okay, now switching over, talking about housing, I find this really interesting. Greater Cincinnati's housing market is actually outperforming that of the United of the U.S., Hoffman said. Home prices here rose 7.5% over the past year through November. Nationally, prices climbed around 5%. That's largely because the local market didn't experience the extreme highs a couple of years ago, so it had more room to gain now. Housing prices nationally rose more than 20% in the spring and summer of 2022, Cincinnati prices gained 13 to 14% at that same time. He says Cincinnati didn't have the blowout in house prices that the rest of the nation did. It had a little momentum left because it didn't go up as big. Uh, and he expects prices to go up another 3 to 4% this year as interest rates are coming down. So this brings up a point that I want to make. I say this a lot to people, and I'm, I'm trying to get this metaphor down the right way. But... Um, when I explain it to people about Cincinnati's economy and what you can expect here, part of it is like the fact that we are, what I say is we're a river city. And what I mean by that is um, we're pretty steady. <laughs> like we kind of roll along as the river rolls, rolls along. We don't generally when the market, when the national economy is really hot, we don't get as hot as some of the hottest cities we go up, but we just don't, we're not usually like one of the booming cities on the flip side of that. When there's a recession, we don't go as low because we didn't go crazy high. 
So when things are good national, when things are great nationally, generally things are good in Cincinnati. And when things are terrible nationally, generally things aren't terrible in Cincinnati. We're pretty steady overall. And so that's what you've seen is this steady growth over the past year or so, whereas nationally prices climbed around 5%. And in some cities, those prices were starting to come down. Cincinnati rose 7.5% last year because we didn't hit those peaks as high as other cities in 2021 and 22. We had big growth. Uh, so it says nationally, you know, that growth might have been 20% nationally. Here it was 13 to 14%. So we're never too high. We're never too low. Cincinnati's always kind of right in the middle. And I that, that's kind of how I explain it to people all the time is like, look, it's a very steady, solid city. Like it's, it's got a wide base economically speaking. It's diversified in term, in terms of its industry and economics and different jobs. And we're always kind of right in the middle. I, I don't foresee a time where it, now it could happen. And a lot of these cities have blown up. Like Nashville has blown up, right? Austin, Texas, for example, uh, different cities in Florida. And now they're starting to come back down a little bit. Since he hasn't seen that boom. And again, I think part of that is like we, you know, when you look nationally, um, you know, we're right above that sunbelt where you've seen a lot of money go from institutional investing in the last five to 10 years from the Black Rocks and the, these different places have been these, um, you know, these these sunbelt cities, you know, Phoenix uh, in, in Texas, Dallas, uh, Nashville, Florida, Atlanta. That's where a lot of the money has gone. And that has really driven home prices up. Cincinnati's right on the north cusp of that. Our weather's what I've been telling people is like our weather's like just crappy enough to not get like the major investment. And so what does that mean? It means we are steadily growing. It means that you can still get jobs here. It means that home prices are still relatively affordable here. Um and also, you know, to the point of this article, we do a good job of retaining talent when it comes because when people get here they're like Oh, the city has a lot to offer. I kind of like it here. I talked to uh, a fisher rep this week, uh, a young lady who uh, grew up in around Columbus area, but went to college down here at UC and she ended up staying here. I'm like, well, why didn't you move back home by your family? She's like, the city's cooler. <laughs> like I like, I like Cincinnati. It has more to offer than Columbus. Columbus is kind of flat and there's like not a whole lot going on. Cincinnati, I like it here. So I'm living here. It doesn't mean she won't move to somewhere else, but that I think that's a pretty common story that when people, oftentimes Cincinnati is overlooked nationally, um, but when they get here, they're kind of like, oh, this is like great. <laughs> and I can raise my family here and I could stay here a long time. And I think that's, that's, a good, uh, that's a good analogy and a metaphor overall for Cincinnati. So, okay. So going back to this, um, you know, home prices, he's expecting them to gain another three or 4% this year. Interest rates are coming down a bit. And the supply of new homes is still relatively low. We've talked about that a lot on the channel, how inventory is low. And I don't see that really cracking uh, anytime too soon in the next five to seven years. That forecast doesn't call for huge growth, but it's an improvement from previous predictions. Again, that's what I think Cincinnati is. It's not generally a place where it's going to like blow up. And in fact, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to people who are moving here from, let's say, Vegas or Dallas or Nashville or name the city. They're kind of like our city blew up and it's kind of annoying and traffic's everywhere. And, um, you know, social services aren't keeping up, uh, with crime potentially. And I'd like to go someplace that doesn't blow up. And I'm like, Hey, welcome to Cincinnati, the city that doesn't blow up from a economic standpoint, from a population standpoint, we're just kind of like even keel, steady growth. We're river city. We're average. And I mean that in a complimentary way, Cincinnati is very average when you look at like population numbers, when you look at overall growth. Um, I'm not saying it can't blow up and, and become a really popular city, but as of now, I've lived here 30 years. How, how old am I? Thir almost 35 years now. It's always been like fairly steady under the radar. So uh, if you're looking for that, this is a great city for that. Um, six, six months ago, we didn't expect any increase. He's talking about home prices, but there it was, there was a five, there was seven and a half percent increase last year. Um, and that's, if you were listening to my channel, I was like, guys, there's no inventory. Like it has to grow. And I'm going to show you the real estate uh, stats here in just a second. Nationally, Hoffman expects the economy to avoid a mild recession. It grew at a surprisingly hot 
3% last year, Cincinnati did. This year, he's looking for slower growth of around 1.5% growth in the GDP. He expects inflation to cool off after it drops significantly, and also interest rates are going to be dropping. So if interest rates are dropping, and a lot of people are asking me this, um, a lot of people who are, in fact, I had a listing appointment with someone this week. He's like, hey, if interest rates drop, um, that means more people can afford more house. You would expect that the housing market to go up, right? And I'm like, yeah, that, that's probably what's going to happen. And the Fed has indicated that multiple times now uh, that they're going to drop. Uh, they, they said three times this year, three to four cuts. And they're talking about um, a basis points of at least a quarter percent each time. So could you see rates get down in the sixes and the fives even this year? Yeah, potentially. If that happens, what's probably going to happen is a lot of people who got priced out last year or who like as rates went up to and hit those peaks of 8%, they're like, yeah, pause. I'm not going to buy this year. Just going to save up some more money. We'll see if interest rates come down. I mean, that happened to the tune of about 20 to 25% less units sold overall in Cincinnati. That also meant there were less sellers because as interest rates went up, there was a lot of people who were like, you know, I've got this two and three quarter interest rate or three or three and a half. I don't really want to sell this house and go get a six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent interest rate. It just does, it doesn't make sense financially. But as those rates go down, you're going to see two things. More sellers are probably going to list their home in the market, but also more buyers are going to jump in the market. So we, are you going to see a lot more inventory? No. Is, that, is there a reason why I keep showing new construction houses uh, on this channel? Yes. It doesn't mean you can't buy a resale home, but I just think inventory is still in that kind of bind uh, and will be for, for several more years here. Um, okay. So just kind of wrapping this up. It, it according accordingly uh, interest rate it probably doesn't end there. Lower inflation opens the opportunity for rate cuts, uh, despite so big stock market gains uh, and a hot start. He does expect the market to climb more. So there he's getting into the the stock market a little bit more. Um, so overall, he's expecting growth in Cincinnati from the GDP standpoint. He's expecting interest rates to go down. He's expecting housing prices to go up a little bit. Um, and again, like I'm talking about, Cincinnati's kind of steady here. I want to show you guys um, some data. Give me just a second. I'm going to launch um, this tab, this window right here. Okay. Um, I've done this before. I've shown you guys some of these charts before, but let me dig into charts and data. Woo, data. Yay. All right, I'm going to go full screen here, guys, so you can see this better. And let's look at, let's see if I can get this bigger. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let's look at what's going on in the Cincinnati real estate market. Okay. And you can follow my cursor here. Yes. So here's what's happening. This is uh, looking at Claremont, Butler, Warren, and Hamilton counties. Those are the four counties on the Cincinnati side, the Ohio side of the river, uh, where the most homes sell kind of in the greater Cincinnati area. These numbers generally, if you're looking at Northern Kentucky as well, are, are roughly the same. When you look at sale, uh, median sale prices and um, inventory sold and all that, it's roughly the same in Northern Kentucky as Cincinnati. Um, but I can only pull one of these at a time. So what we're looking at here is the median price sold over a two-year period from February of 2022 uh, through 2023, all the way up to February of 2024. Okay. The median sale price back in February of 22 was $250,000. That median sale price right now is $290,000. It hit a peak in last, uh, summer, uh, right around May and June is where it hit its peak. And it came down slightly in July and August as interest rates went up. And that peak number was 310,000. Uh, for the peak median sale price. Now, what I want to point you to here, what stands out to me um, is a large jump here in February from uh, January to February. If you go back to February of last year, you do see a jump. And generally, you will see this, um, you know, the prices tend to come down from the end of fall, usually like November, December, and January. They kind of come down a bit. Um, that certainly happened last year as well, but it happened a little bit earlier from October because that's when those interest rates really started peaking. So October, November, December, and January prices were coming down. 
Um, and I, if you guys, again, if you were listening to my channel, I was saying, guys, buy in the winter, <laughs> buy in the winter, buy in the winter. Um, that's when you're going to get the best quote unquote deal because, um, you know, there's, there's less inventory, but there's also, you know, um, there's less buyers out there. And so, uh, December, the, the winter in general, if you guys look over the past two years, if you're trying to get a quote unquote deal, that's when you can kind of get the best price. Also, if sellers are out there on the market and, you know, and the days on market are racking up a little bit, they're willing to take a little bit of a hit to get the thing sold. So, but what stands out to me, what's really interesting is this is a big jump. This is a big jump in price from January to February. I, I it, It's possible that March will go down or not, or maybe be about the same here as February because uh, Typically, it kind of is a slow rise up until May or June for median home price, but this is um, this is kind of what I'm, I'm expecting. And uh, the reason I'm expecting this, pull myself up here. The reason I'm expecting this again is there's again there was a lot of buyer demand that sat out towards the end of last year. We had less units sold last year, and I think as soon as this market starts ramping up here in the spring, it's going to be crazy town again. Uh, it's going to be multiple offers. It's going to be low days on market and prices will be going up through spring and summer. So if you're thinking of uh, potentially selling this year and you, you didn't want to last year because rates were so high, but rates are coming down a little bit. I just want you to be aware of this as you're thinking about selling your home here in 2024. I expect it to be yet again, uh, low inventory and prices going up through the summer. Now you don't want to wait too long. You should be think you should be getting your house ready now because you want to hit that summer buying season or the end of spring when people are wanting to move when the kids are out of school. That's the that's the busiest time, that's the best weather and that's the best time to sell. Uh, now if you're a buyer, uh, it it can be a good time to buy in the fact that you get more inventory to choose from, you get more opportunities, but be prepared that you're going to be seeing more competition again this spring. And so you'll probably be in that multiple offer game again, if you're buying um, a resale home, new construction, that's a different animal, uh, but probably we're going to be seeing new, new construction price hikes as well. All right. I want to go back to this and I want to look at the next slide. Uh, if I can here. Whoop. Okay. So this is um, same, same chart in terms of median price, but this is just the last six months. And this is on a weekly basis. And again, what I want to point out to you here is you can kind of see how prices went down, down, down from the end of September down into, uh, you know, November, December, and January, they were lowering. And then here in February, especially this last week, bam, big, big bump up here in this lack last week of, um, of February. And they kind of went up in general over January. So that's just, you know, a chart looking at the last six months. All right. I want to go to this next chart here, which is um, units sold. And uh, this is a supply and demand chart of the amount of units for sale and the amount of units sold. Okay. So what we're looking at here, um, get myself out of the way, is uh, all of the red uh, bar graph here are the amount of units for sale. And all of the green are the amount sold. Okay. So where are we at inventory wise? If you look at February of 2024, even January, it is higher than January and February of 23. So the, kind of the low point in terms of looking at the last year or two was um, February of 23. That was the lowest point. It's still low. Um, okay. It's still low overall but it's not quite as low as last year. And again, the reason I think that's that's happening and the reason why I think we'll see even more inventory as rates come down a little bit um, and as people who wanted to sell maybe the last few years but didn't, um, I think we're going to see more of those people who are like, hey, it's time. You know, We waited, interest rates went up, but maybe they're coming down a little bit this year. So I think we are going to see a little bit more units for sale this year. Um, now, going back to this chart, uh, what you're also seeing is the amount of units sold. And so uh, not, a, not a ton yet, but what, but again, what you're seeing here is that jump from January to February. So we saw overall, again, the Cincinnati region saw about 20% less sales of units overall in 23 than in 22. 
And a lot of real estate agents were hurting because, you know, just think of your business. If you're down 20 to 25 percent and typically, you know, typically who that hurts are the are the people who only sell a few houses a year it hurts them the most. People like not to brag, but someone, someone like me who sells a lot more units. I was like, man, OK, units are down a little bit because of the market overall, but it didn't hurt my business overall as it did people who sell like four houses a year. Right. That's like, uh, OK, that's a that's a giant chunk of your income. So a lot of those agents even got out of the business. Um, and it was a tough year for the real estate industry overall because the amount of units were down and they're like, hang in there. It's going to get better. I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm just going to do my thing and like do videos and uh, try to educate people and give them good, good content and good value. So um, but but if you look going back to this chart, uh, the point I'm trying to make here and let's look at the actual numbers. If I can see this. It says the amount of units for sale. Man, I'm having a hard time reading that. Was down 16 percent. Um, I think, is, is that what it says? Yeah, okay, here it is. The amount of percent was down 6%. And the, the amount of units sold year from 24, from this 24 February to 22 was down 44%. So that's showing a huge amount uh, of the amount of actual sold units. And you can kind of see that in this green chart right here, like how much more there is in this green swale than this green swale. So again, a big part of that was in, in rehashing the story was the fact that interest rates went up and people, you know, a lot of buyers who maybe wanted to buy last year are like, dude, no, I'm not, I'm not doing an 8% loan. I'm going to wait. And, uh, and, and, and that's probably paying off for them a little bit this year. And likewise, you know, my prediction, so to speak on this is like, Hey, we're in an election year. Anytime you've got an incumbent president who can maybe pull a few levers potentially, um, to try to make pe voters happy. <laughs> Uh, you know, what does that mean? That means probably trying to get the interest rates lower so that people can afford more. Um, I, I think that's going to happen. So I think you're going to see more units sold this year, but also what that means is I think you're going to see more prices. So let, let's look at uh, our prices going up. Let's look at this last chart here. Uh, this is the month's supply of inventory. So what this means is if no new homes hit the market, how many, uh, how long would it take for all the homes on the market to sell? Okay. And what you're seeing again, is, again, this is just another chart telling the same story, which is that a lot of people stopped buying <laughs> last fall as rates went up and, and even, and the months of supply of inventory went up. And this is why I was, I was like banging on the table, like in, in December and January, I was like, people, this is the time. This is like the best time we've seen in the last few years, buy a house now. Uh, and again, I, I understand why no one likes to do that. I understand that like there's Christmas and there's New Year's and you're working your job and it's freezing cold and it's like pitch dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. So I get why it's difficult to buy a house in the winter. But again, I, I think um, I think in many ways, but oftentimes I think economically and like the best deal. And I was like, buy in the winter uh, because the month's supply of inventory was shooting up here you guys see you guys can see that like bam and anytime you have um you know when 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 it goes that high compared to where it's been the last few years and you've got sellers where everything has been selling in uh you know a, a few days or whatever and the days on market's creeping up and they're like looking at the real estate agent like why is my uh, home not sold? It's, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. It's been three weeks. And they're freaking out because they saw their neighbor's house sell in freaking six hours with 30 offers over the last two years. And they, you know, they're like picked an offer that was $30,000 over list price with no repairs. And then they went and drank, uh, you know, on an island in Tahiti somewhere. And they're like, why is it my house sold? And I was like, and for buyers, that's the opportunity. When you've got a seller who's like nervous and, and a little bit motivated, bam, that's the time to strike. That's the time you hit up team Staniel. We're like coming in hot and being like, let's, let's, uh, yeah, we're not giving you your list price because where are your other offers? You don't have any other offers. So we, we're going to help our sellers and our buyers. It, it all depends on what's going on in the market. But like, um, going back to this chart, this is what happened last year. Uh, this last winter, bam, 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 months of in inventories, um, really rose, but look what happened in January and February. Bing, bing. And um, 
steep decreases, right? The steepest decreases over the last two years. So big chunks off in terms of uh, months of supply of inventory. So inventory is going back down uh, because the buyers, like the rates are coming down and buyers want it. So um, all that to say, uh, you had your chance and I warned you <laughs> if you were looking to buy. No, I'm just kidding. You can still buy, obviously, but just know like it's going to be a little bit crazy again this spring and summer. If you're buying a resale home, the inventory is going to be low again because, again, I'm just going to keep telling the story over and over again. I hope it makes sense to you guys because um, we're trying to help you make wise decisions financially with your home. But it's, uh, you know, when there's low inventory, and when there's, a, when there's low supply and high demand, prices are going to go up. And if you're trying to buy a resale home, you've got to move kind of quick, but not too quick because you want to be like the last one in there on the offer. It's a whole thing. We got strategies for you. Um, and you're probably going to, you know, you're probably going to be in competitive situations. So there, for example, had a client this weekend, we went and saw two houses. There's one that uh, was a coming soon, which in Ohio means you can mark it coming soon. It goes out in the MLS. Everyone can see it. Everyone can schedule a showing. It was in Loveland. It was listed for 335. Uh, about two hours into it being active, the listing agent's like, we're in multiple offers. Send us your highest and best by 6 p.m. And uh, I told my buyers like, hey, look, you can go for this one. But based on the comps in this neighborhood, it's going to go for 30 or 40 over list price. I, I guarantee you that. And they're like, yeah, we don't like it that much. I'm like, I, I, I get it. That That's fine. That's that's the market we're in right now. And so um, that's probably what you're going to see on the buyer's side. So there's the data, guys. Um, I hope that is helpful for you uh, as you're kind of understanding the Cincinnati real estate market. What's up, Alex? Daylight savings time next week. Yay. So yay for we get more daylight. We lose an hour of sleep, though, right? Isn't that what happens? I always forget. I think we lose an hour in the spring. We move clocks forward an hour. So we lose an hour, but we get more daylight, which is great. I do. I do love me uh, heading into springtime, just getting those longer days. Um, and yeah, we're heading into red season. Uh, the boys of summer uh, baseball season. It's great. Always exciting. So, okay, let's. Um, I'm going to switch off of this one and go back. Got a few more headlines, and I'm going to bounce out of here for tonight, guys. Uh, if you've got questions, feel free to get them in. I got a few other um, articles and some tips. I do want to say something about new construction. I'll get to that in just a minute. If you are thinking new construction, um, one second here. Okay, window. I need this one. Okay. Because some big, uh, kind of some big news happened with Fisher over the past few weeks. And I think I'm going to do a dedicated video. Watch for a, there's, I'm not going to lie. There's probably going to be a clickbaity kind of a uh, thumbnail on it. Um, but Fisher made a pretty big move in the last few weeks. And Fisher Homes is the largest um, home builder in Cincinnati. They sell the most amount of homes. And they did something like that's quite interesting that you guys, if you are thinking new construction, you definitely should know about Alex. Yep. Spring forward, fall back. Yes. So spring forward, clocks forward. Although much better if we stay on one or the other. Aren't they trying to, uh, aren't the congressmen like, I thought they, they had a bill trying to eliminate this forever. Right. I don't, I don't know what's happening with that, but they didn't do it. Okay. Let's, um, so yes, the, at least we'll get more sunshine longer. I like that. Okay. Let me bring this up. And next article I want to show you guys. Okay. Cincinnati lands in the top 10 most competitive rental markets to stop. So just kind of carrying on this story. I'm not going to read this whole article, but, um, you know, in terms of the economy and in terms of people moving here, in terms of people uh, being attracted to Cincinnati, retaining in Cincinnati, um, since he is one of the most competitive, competitive rental markets. So uh, I get people, you know, a lot, obviously, who are looking to move here asking me, hey, can we help? Can you help us on the rental side? And the answer is like kind of, sort of, not really. The, the problem is, you know, as a real estate agent, um, because demand is so high and inventory so low on the rental side as well, nobody really puts uh, any rental properties on the multiple listing service because they don't need a real estate agent to get it sold. They can throw it on Zillow. They can throw it on apartments.com or whatever um, and, and get the tenants that they need. And so they're like, why should we pay? Um, a realtor, uh, a commission for that. And so we can't, there's not really much that we can do in this space. Otherwise, other than say, check 
zillow.com check apartments.com check facebook marketplace even as a spot if you're looking for a short-term rental or something like that um, or even just a lot of times you can get homes on marketplace when you've got landlords who um you know they're more like mom and pop landlords and so that's a decent place to check for stuff um but in general we can kind of talk to you about neighborhoods and certainly if you're coming here to rent for a little bit we'd love to talk to you in the future about buying a house in terms of helping you actually go find a rental. We don't do that, but we're happy to give you any information about the area um, that we can help with. So, okay, just um, a little bit on this article. Cincinnati's already meeting high demand expectations for renters this year uh, with a new report naming it one of the top 10 hottest rental markets in the United States, a first for the Queen City. Uh, rent Cafe and its latest U.S. rental market competitive had us as the eighth most competitive rental market in the nation. That's the highest Cincinnati has ever climbed in the quarterly report. Cincinnati is uh, started 2023 ranked number 17. Okay, so they're up to eighth. And the competitive is based on the number of prospective renters competing for an apartment and the percentage of renters renewing their leases and the number of days apartments were vacant. In Cincinnati, less multifamily construction starts paired with a higher than average lease renewal rate propelled the city to the top of the list. I'm going to read that one more time. In Cincinnati, less multifamily construction starts paired with a higher than average lease renewal rate propelled the city toward the top of the list. So the reason why um, Cincinnati is ranked in the top 10 for hottest rental markets is um, we don't have enough multifamily units. Uh, circle back to the connected communities video I did a few weeks ago and keep an eye on that. Cause, cause that's, um, one way the city is trying to figure it out. They're basically trying to get more density into the city by allow, by easing up the zoning code to allow for more duplexes, triplexes, quads, um, row home, row houses, basically more density in the same space, uh, with less parking requirements. So they're trying to incentivize developers. Uh, I talked to actually, um, and I'm going to talk to him again this week, but I talked to an attorney who um, was like, it, it doesn't go far enough. We need to blow up the whole zoning code and start over. This is kind of a patchwork idea. And I, so I'm going to try to keep uh, investigating on this because I think it's really interesting in terms of the direction of the city at large. May not impact you guys at all, but I just, um, I, I like kind of investigating and exploring like, the thought processes of building the city for the long run, because I'm living here for the long run. <laughs> I've got five kids and we're going to be living here for a long time. So I want the city to be great um, for, for generations. So anyway, that's, that's that article. Um, I'm going to move on from that one. J just like in the housing, basically, you know, just like on the housing side, the, the rental market is hot as well in Cincinnati because people are renewing their leases because there's not a lot of stuff out there and there's not a lot of multifamily being built. So if you are a real estate developer, um, you might want to come to Cincinnati. Okay. Um, a few other articles for tonight. And then I want to touch on the Fisher Homes uh, story that I mentioned. Um, Kentucky improves incentives to lure $114 million water bottling plant to Boone County. Sweet. I'm all for it. Was, uh, I live in Boone County. My parents live in Boone County, went to Boone County high school, Boone County. And I, I talk about this a lot when I'm talking to people, to buyers, Boone County, I think is the easiest County to kind of build, um, develop in Northern Kentucky because it's kind of flatter independence and Alexandria is, but it gets the terrain kind of gets hillier as you go east it's not that you can't develop it it's just boone county is kind of poised for it the most so large 114 million dollar manufacturing facility to come into boone county um they are a leading private labeled bottled water company in the u.s they're coming in from california uh and bringing so again that's just this just goes along with the economic development that we're seeing they're bringing in uh 60 people at an average hourly wage of more than $45 an hour. So you got jobs, you've got economic development, $51 million to build, land acquisition of around 4.4 million, 63.3 million to outfit it with equipment. Um, so that's a big win, big win for Northern Kentucky, big win for uh, Boone County and more economic development in the area. Always glad to see that. Good job, Boone County. Um, 
Sipsy Klein, this is just more on the real estate side, but this is a competing broker in the city. They bought out um, another another brokerage in Star Realty. Uh, Greenline Kitchen Cocktails. Uh, this is, I just wanted to share this briefly because this is in my hometown. And uh, Fort Thomas is a tough spot. <laughs> it can be to build restaurants, but they, right in the heart of Fort Thomas, they did a kind of a, uh, a renewed uh, mixed retail space where they put the coffee shop. And a couple doors down is was this bank that they redid into a, a restaurant. And it's called the Green Line. Um, and they say it's doing well. They wanted to see if it was doing well before they started um, really putting out some press. So this is kind of the first press I've seen about it. And since it's in my hometown, I want to say, yeah, uh, cool. Let's go. Fort Thomas. I'm a big fan of Fort Thomas. Um, it's walkable, great school district. Um, you know, there's not a ton of places where you can, and let me see if I can bring this up real quick. Let's go one Highland Avenue. Uh, there's not a lot of places in Cincinnati where you kind of have the walkability and neighborhood that you get in Fort Thomas. So this is the new building that went in a few years back. It's got an awesome coffee shop, Fort Thomas Coffee right here, which was across the street. Um, their dentist, they moved into a dentist here, you know, a few other retail. This is, this construction is a little old, uh, or these, these Google maps pictures, but I can walk to my dentist. Now I can walk to the post office. I can walk to, um, you know, my kids can walk to this little convenient mart and get candies and, and treats. Um, so there's a taco shop, Komal, which is great, by the way, highly recommend that. Um, and here's the green line. It was under construction, but this is where that restaurant is. And so great neighborhood, um, you know, walkability. There's, there's no school buses in Fort Thomas. It's all, you know, kids were walking to school. So it's just got that kind of friendly and, and where it is on the map. Um, the reason why I really like Fort Thomas as well, I don't know why I'm necessarily pitching this, but, um, let's see here if I can pull this up. The reason why you have that walkability is because Fort Thomas is kind of surrounded by the river one and you're, and it's, and it's up on a hill. So you take 1120 up to get up. It kind of goes a hill all the way up. There's a hill this way. So you're only going to Fort Thomas really, if you're going to Fort Thomas. So there's no real through traffic. And on one sense, it's great because, um, it's safe, it's walkable, you know, kids can ride their bikes and, and go around town. On the other side, it can make restaurants like this really hard to exist because you don't get a lot of that through traffic. It's just the kind of the people. And, and, and again, a lot of people aren't going to Fort Thomas unless they live there. So um, we'll see. We'll see if it can make it. I hope it does. I, I do wish, you know, they say it's like a great place for family and community to meet. But when you're serving things like lamb meatballs and with harissa sauce and slow roasted prime rib and seafood carbonara and gnocchi stroganoff it's a little i i was really hoping that it was going to be like um more affordable <laughs> to be quite honest and like uh it's a, it's going to be a great place to, to for a date but i can't take my kids like i can't take five kids there to eat uh seafood carbonara like i, I, I i'm sorry i can't do that we're going to chipotle so, um, and Comal across the street, which has $2 taco Tuesdays. Uh, and we did that this week and it was awesome, but I hope it makes it. I just, uh, I'm, I don't know. We need it. I don't, this is Fort Thomas life, so I'm not going to get into too much. Okay. Last thing I wanted to mention, um, before, before jumping off here for tonight is, uh, well, I guess a couple of things here. Um, there's a spring. If you are looking at new construction, I talk about Fisher homes and Dries homes a lot on the channel. They are both great. Um, what I want to say, uh, well, first of all, they're doing a, an event in spring where you can get a free gift card if you want to go see homes. But here's what I want to say. I want to say this very, very clearly. Do not go to Fisher homes unless you, uh, if you want to work with a real estate agent and have representation, do not talk to them before you talk to your real estate agent. Because uh, they made a big change recently. Nothing changed on their actual paperwork. They've made a change in their implementation where if you do not name in your first visit with a Fisher Home rep or if you call in and do an online, if you do not name the real estate agent that you're working with, they're not going to allow you to have a realtor to be representation throughout your build process. You're only going to get to work 
with their sales counselors and their builders, um, which is great. They do a fantastic job. They do great work. Um, however, they work for the builder. Okay. They don't work for you. They're trying to sell you a house. And so the nice thing about having an agent is that, um, you know, Fisher Homes, Dries Homes, they have this in their marketing budget to pay for the agent, to pay the commission to the agent. Um, and the nice thing about you, it doesn't cost you, it doesn't cost you the buyer anything that it's the seller where that commission is coming from. It's the builder. Um, and you get that full representation and you have someone who's kind of a third party who's not working for the builder. So if you have, and, and this happens all the time, there's going to be things in your build process, or even if you're buying a spec home or a market home where you want someone to go to bat for you against the builder. And, and if you don't have that, you're kind of having to do that all on your own and it, it can be tough. Um, so I'll, I'll show you kind of what's happened here. Um, so, uh, let me show you this. Okay. So here's, I'm going to do an actual video of this. I just, if you guys are thinking of new construction, I just wanted you to know this. And I talked to, I don't know, like four or five people this week about new construction. Mm -hmm. And so before you go, and I, like I said, I'm going to make a more concise video of this to try to get the word out. And I'm not trying to bash Fisher homes. I'm really not. I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm a little scratching my head on this, on why they're making this decision. I, I get it. I think, I think the reason they're doing this is that they are trying to save some on commissions. And I do think sometimes, I don't know all the situations, but sales counselors might add a real estate agent who wasn't, who shouldn't have been on, on that deal. And, and maybe they're, you know, scratching each other's backs a little bit. Um, and so maybe they're trying to get a little bit of that out of the system. I totally get it. The way they want this to happen is exactly how the, I know this because they told me this. So like, we like what you do on your channel and what you we want you to do is bring a lead to us and you, and have that introduction meeting. And then everything's great because you're the one who brought the lead to us. But if a lead comes in and meets with our sales counselor and then they say, and then they go, because this is what happens for me a lot. Uh, someone goes and talks to Fisher Homes or they go um, look at the website or they go to a model home and then they they will do some research and they start seeing reviews. They're like, I don't know. She's like, should I try? And then they start to do more research online and they come across a lot of my content because I've done a lot, a lot of videos on Fisher. And they call me up. They're like, hey, wh what do you think? Like, you know, are they good? Are they bad? Like, um, and I'll, I give them my honest opinion. I'm like, yeah, you could use them. There's, there's other builders. They're the number one builder. You know, they get a lot of bad. They do get a lot of bad reviews online. But honestly, I don't think they spend a lot of time trying to get the best Google reviews because they're the number one builder and they've kind of like, they're like, not that they don't care, but they're kind of like, we're going to sell houses regardless of if our Google reviews aren't five star all the way. Um, so they don't, and also each community has its own reviews. So like, um, they have their own, you know, marketing efforts. And, um, so anyway, but if someone comes to me and says, well, will you be my agent? I'll be like, yeah, I'll call up Fisher. And that person may have already met with a Fisher rep. And sometimes in the past, what's, what's generally happened is they said, oh, the client wants me to be their agent. Can you register me with them on the file to be their agent? Most of the times, Fisher has said yes to that. But it, to be fair, that kind of goes against their, their rule, their policy. And that's what I'm going to show you right here in black and white. Their policy says, look, we're going to pay a commission to a broker, 3%. Uh, but here's what needs to happen. The broker must a threshold the purchaser by making the first person, the first in-person introduction at the initial contact between builder and purchaser, including purchaser advising the builder of the broker's name. At, so basically you have to make the introduction. Um, the agent does. So, and this happens a lot. I'll say, I have people who are moving in from out of town. I say, are you interested in new, new construction? They'll say, yes. I'm like, great. Let me, I've got a couple of people that I work with that are fantastic. Uh, send off an email. Um, they'll make an introduction. And once they have kind of a video call or they meet in person, then it's locked in with that sales counselor. Uh, that sales counselor will register me to them agent. No problem. The issue is when that first meeting happens without the agent. And I've said this before in videos like, hey, make sure you do this first. You might want to. But again, Fisher cracked down on this. And they're like, I had a couple... I'm hearing a lot of stories right now. Uh, and I, and I had it happen to me personally with a client who, like I said, met with them first and then found me. It was like, I want you to be the agent. I called Fisher. They want me to be the agent. And they were like, no, not happening. I'm like, 
uh, what? Um, so number one is you have to make, you have to, the agent has to be at the threshold. And number two, they have to be the procuring cause of the contract. Meaning like, um, you know, th they're the reason why they're, they're, they're the reason why the lead came in and why they signed a contract. Um, you know, as part of it. So intro meeting, threshold meeting and procuring cause is what's in black and white. And so what Fisher has done uh, in this last few weeks here, and it's causing a bit of a stir, <laughs> I would say, is they're like, they're enforcing this, like, no, this is the thing. And if they come in later, too bad. And my only question to them is like, well, what about when the client specifically says, I want Eric Stanio and his team to be my agent? And they're saying that to you and they haven't signed a contract yet. And I'm saying to Fisher, like, I really think you should maybe add a C like you have an A and a B, maybe a C that says like, yes, I want to go forward. Yes. I know maybe they weren't there when they thresholded me, but I'm telling you Fisher Holmes, I won't move forward unless I have this agent, please allow him on or, or her on or whatever. And I'm like, I think that would be a good idea. We'll see where this goes. Uh, as of now, they're not doing that as, as of now, other builders, Trees Homes, for example, are kind of like, hmm, all right, well, there might be some people uh, and there might be some disgruntled agents, which I know there are right now, um, because this is already, you know, this is a week or two into implementation. I've heard several stories already of um, of this being an issue and and an agent not being able to be added onto the, the contract. And that's and I've I've only talked to a few people, so I know this is happening left and right. Um, I'm. Again, overall, I, I understand if I'm the owner of Fisher Homes, I understand why they would do this or whoever's making the decisions. It's probably not the owner. It's, you know, presidents, whatever. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're probably trying to cut down on some commissions that you don't think are deserved or, or the agents actually weren't the procuring cause. I totally get that. Like that makes total sense. Um, but I think what's, you know, what they, they got to find the break even point <laughs> of paying less commissions, but also like irritating realtors or irritating clients. Cause I, I, I then gave my client the example was like, Hey, you can go with Fisher homes still totally. Like if you want them, I completely understand, go, go forward and choose their neighborhood and their, their designs. Um, you know, but I just can't be your agent, you, you know, and I'm like, or, you know, there are other options. And I just, you know, a lot of other agents, I'm sure are going to do the same thing. Like um, if they're working with clients who are looking at resale homes or who are looking at new construction, what I always want to do is I want to give my client all the options. And so what, what, what is making me scratch my head a little bit here and what I asked a Fisher manager specifically was like, how is this in the best interest of the client? Like if the client wants the agent representation, like, and you're not giving it to them, that's not, that's not serving them well. That That's just my opinion. Again, I'm lowly. I don't make the big decisions. I'm not running a, like a billion dollar a year business. And so I'm sure there are other factors I don't know about. Um, I am just saying this to you guys who are out there. Cause I know a lot of you are, when you're moving here because the inventory is so low, um, you're thinking about new construction. I just, uh, and strongly saying and advising you that like reach out to me first reach out to our team first so that we can make that introduction and get registered and then it's fine and that doesn't mean you have to go with them that just means you can at least have an agent with uh you know with you throughout the process if you if you so want that if you don't want that then i just wasted 20 minutes of talking for no reason but like uh, i at least want to make i'm trying to get some awareness out there this is a change it's a big change like in the past um, I was able to get added on potentially after that threshold meeting. It's not happening right now. So, um, wanted you guys to know that. Okay. <sighs> so, so box over, I'm going to try to write that all into a more of like a four or five minute video so that, um, people know that. Okay. Alex, uh, same could be said when you live near Jeff Ruby and like downtown needs more fast casual options. Totally fast. Casual is like the way to go. Um, you know, and, and downtown, yeah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for getting people down there. There's another news story I saw where um, Kroger didn't re-up one of the leases on their commercial space. And it's so there's this we've talked about this on the channel where they're trying to get more like kind of apartment conversions downtown, because if people aren't going back to work, um, Kroger being one of the largest like uh, tenants downtown um, and one, one of their buildings, people aren't going back. You're, it's hard for the restaurants. It's hard for the restaurants to survive. 
And so the fast casual, like that's exactly what I think should happen. There's a place for families in particular. I just, I don't know why there's not one in Fort Thomas for the life of me. There was a place in the DC area. I think it was called Kava. Um, and it was so awesome. Um, let me see if I can find that real quick. Kava fast casual. Yeah, this place was so good. It was Mediterranean. It was like basically, you know, um, Mediterranean Chipotle. What's going on here? Yeah, where you can make bowls like this stuff. Um, this would do great. Like, yeah, I can do something that's like 10 bucks each, but I can't do like a $40 a plate deal for my kids. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah, this stuff does great. Um but yeah, yeah, Alex, totally same. I mean, same issue downtown. Um, that's why I do the channel and that's why I try to get more people to come and move to Cincy because our city is awesome. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, guys, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I know my wife could use me at home for sure. Um, oh, I just, uh, another comment here. I just purchased a new Fisher condo using my realtor, Jim Ferguson. I've worked with him. He's great. Using a VA loan. Um, remember, Fisher is a VA certified VA builder. And Dries is not a VA certified VA builder for veterans. Someone else, John, was that you who commented on one of my channels or one of my videos recently? Um, how did that, if you, if you don't mind, if you've got access to type here, how did that, how else did that impact you? Um, I've got to do some research on that. Uh, VA loan. I mean, I, I'm assuming they wouldn't accept the VA loan. Fisher wouldn't. But um, anyway, John, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Um, that is one thing to note. If you guys are using a VA loan, uh, you know, you might need to go Fisher. And so in that case, again, <laughs> reach out to an agent first. Um, otherwise, you, you might be building something and not have um, the agent representation. So um I'm, I'm just going to kind of probably be trying to sound that alarm a little bit again. I, um, it's a big change. And so they're the largest builder in Cincinnati. And uh, I think it's important to know that if you, if you are wanting to build and you aren't, because what they will probably do, and it can, it can be confusing, especially for people who have never built before, you know, you're just like my client who had this situation was just kind of like, I don't know. I just went in there to see a model home. I wasn't, I didn't know that when I registered, I was like committed to that sales counselor or committed to not having an agent. And so what they, what they should do, like, I, I think the way they're being trained, the sales counselors now is there's like a car, a registration card and it says, Hey, how did you hear about us? Um, and are you working with an agent? And those could be, they may or may not say both of those questions. Uh, if they're doing their job, they should be asking you, I think if, if you're working with an agent, but they might just ask you, how'd you hear about us? And if you didn't say, oh, my agent told you to come here, which most, most people don't do. Most people are just like, I just wanted to see the home. And so, um, you know, we were looking online and, you know, I saw this model house and we were thinking of building this one. And so then you're registered in the system. If you don't say at that point, I'm working with an agent, which you might not be yet. <laughs> like, um, cause a lot of people, you know, you're, if, who are going new construction for the first time anyway, they, um, you know, they might not have reached out to an agent first because they didn't think they needed one. So it, that's why I just think like, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I understand, again, I understand if you're a business, if you're trying to save on some commissions, if the agent is not the procuring cause, but um, this might need to be tweaked a little bit. John says, yes, I really want the Dries condo on Stan Union. That's a bummer. Um, where'd you end up going? Uh, you, Trees, Fisher, you know, the, I know condos, they've got some condos in, Tuscany or, um, you know, in fact, um, some different communities here I'm trying to think where I just did a video on pinnacle guys at, uh, if you want a luxury townhome, they have kind of three story townhomes going in there in, in Fort Mitchell. And that's pretty rare. I'm trying to think where else condos in Northern Kentucky are. Yeah. Dries has Dries kind of has union locked down. Um, you know, besides Bally Shannon, and Fisher does have a few homes left at Justify, uh, but Dries has a lot of options there in in uh, Union for sure. Um, I do know there's some condos down in Walton that are being built, and those are pretty cheap. I want to get down there actually. 
let me see where um I forget the name of that community. Not Aosta Valley, but Crossings at Walton Square. So these are a little further south, but they're starting at like 177 to 250. So um let me see here. The Hayward, the Hayward. Let's go by lowest price. You can get in there into a Kimball two bedroom condo for 178 new construction. Um, so I want to get down there because that's that's a really good affordable option. Walton is um growing. I was down there this week and just saw like new uh Dunkin' Donuts, new skyline being built up, um, different developments going in, and um that's that's a pretty affordable community to get in. So I wanted to get down there and shoot shoot uh that one, Crescent Springs. Oh yeah, so that is um I know exactly well, what's the name of that one. Uh oh wait, you did it with Reserves at Meadowood, but no, that's not, I don't think that's the condos. The hills at Crescent Springs. Here it is. Yeah. That's probably it. So in the 220s there. So, you know, that, you know, location wise, you're much closer to the city, obviously. But, um, you know, there's a different in home price of condos, 50 grand more from the start price from the 170s to the 220s. But still, I mean, it's hard to beat that location in Crescent Springs. So thanks, John. I hope that, you know, I hope you really enjoy it. So, sorry, Dries didn't work out for you there. But um, that's awesome. You just purchased. So are they, maybe they're building it out right now, but okay. Um, awesome guys. Thanks for interacting. Uh, as always, this is one of my highlights of the week. I love doing this, trying to get the information out there and let you guys know what's going on in a city in our fair city of Cincinnati, Ohio, and the Northern Kentucky area, the greater Cincinnati at large. Um, hope you have a great week. Got some great weather, some warmer weather coming in. I uh, hope you're getting exciting for spring. And I uh, appreciate you guys watching, subscribing, uh, like this if you wouldn't mind. And uh, we will, we'll see you next time. Oh, big news. We may be, video production might be going up a little bit. There, there may be a higher on the Team Stanio team coming in soon, uh, getting some more, more content out there. Cause I think it's, uh, I think it's helpful for you guys. And I appreciate all the feedback when people are like, Hey, we watch your videos. Super helpful. Thank you. Keep doing them. Um, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for saying that. That's super encouraging to me. Um, and uh, I'm just, uh, just so you know, I'm doubling down. Like I want to build, I, I want to do more and more of that. So uh, we've got some things in the works for that to happen. All right, guys, have a wonderful week and we will talk to you next.